I would like to welcome everyone to this lunch lecture by Baku. Um, Benno from Baku will give you a very interesting lunch lecture about construction errors. Uh, and after the presentation, there's of course time to ask some questions. Uh, and well, that's it. So enjoy the lecture and uh, I shall give the word to Benno. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, I prepared a nice lecture, I think. And I'm going to introduce myself and the company. Uh, this is, uh, well, a short time that you see my face. Now I'm going to share the presentation. And I'm going to talk to you about the technical risks and quality control. First, a bit about myself. Uh, I was graduated in uh, 97 in the, in the TU Delft, civil engineering, and my specialty was uh, geotechnical and uh, foundations. So everything that had to do with ground. And uh, my first job also was uh, in that uh, area where I became a geotechnical designer. I uh, made some at a DHV, DHV, and now it's Royal Haskoning DHV. I made the designs of foundations, building pits, everything to do with groundwater and river dikes. And I also became involved in some uh, type of tunnels, board tunnels, these round tunnels that make way to route and the high speed rail link. Uh, then I went to work at the city of The Hague, the engineering department. I became a project leader at the project for light rail trams from The Hague to Rotterdam. And again, a board tunnel, which is called the Hubertus Tunnel. And I was there for four years and completed the whole the project from start to finish. Then I went to a special kind of company risk management for the insurance companies is what we did at Clark and we made risk assessments for the surrounding areas. What is the effect of your construction on surrounding areas? And that's very interesting for insurance companies. Now I work at Bauku for a few years and I am a project leader of all the quality control projects. So I do risk assessments. I also do quality inspections on site, something that I like very much. And I'm like I said, a project leader for all the projects, some projects of quality control we do with my colleagues in the project team at Bauku. On the right, you can see me in my younger years uh, at the Betuwe Route and in the middle in this uh, type of tunnel, this board tunnel in The Hague. And my minute of fame at the NOS Journal on television where they had an interview with me about quality control. Next sheet, I'm going to present today uh, a little bit about Bauku, what we do, then very uh, yeah, severe damages and failures, some examples you've probably heard of. We talk about the origins and the causes of these damages and then quality control. Then I give you some nice examples of projects that I work on at Bauku regarding quality control. And I hope I will finish this in time. I'm going to look at my watch. Yep. Okay, the company. Bauku. We are a technical quality control company for the construction area, and that is all that we do. We have 25 technical employees, engineers from your university or other education. We are independent, which means that we are not a part of a contractor or an engineering firm. Those are the parties that we have to check, of course. We do quality control of all the designs, all the construction on site, and for every technical scope that you have, that you have in the building code, Baubesluit in Dutch. And we have this drawing on the right. We check your technical installations in the building. We check your architecture design, structural safety, which is a big one, fire safety, and building physics. We are very interested to learn from other countries, and that's why we are a member of the Consortium of European building control so that gives us a lot of information and for your information we have three founding fathers who started Bauku in 2003 uh, TNO specialists in structures Deltares specialists in geotechnical affairs and SGS they specialize in all the materials you need for construction and if we have a question at Bauku we can still call these old colleagues now they left the country 
uh, they left the company and as I said, we are now an independent company. Okay, so again, what do we do? Independent technical quality control. We look at your design, which means calculations, drawings. We come to the construction site and we do quality checks on what you are building. We also do audits on the quality processes of our clients. It's very important nowadays. We do risk management for insurance companies. So we tell them what is the risk of a damage and what will you have to pay if it occurs? What can you do to, to control it? And then there is special quality control, which means that a client calls us with a special question. Maybe they want just a piece of the project to check, to be checked, or they have a different question. And those are always surprises and very nice projects to work on. On the right, you see some nice examples of projects that we do. Sometimes things go terribly wrong. And I'm going to give you some well-known examples, just a picture, and we talk a bit about what happens, what is the cause, things like that. So first of all, I start with, you've probably seen it a few years ago, in 2018 in Italy, this bridge collapsed suddenly while in use, people were driving their cars. A big disaster and almost 40 people died. This bridge was 50 years old and it was built like every bridge for 100 years. So of course, when something like this happens, there is a big investigation and people are trying to find out what is the reason. Well, for this, special uh, project, there was not one reason. There were, as you call it, contributing factors. So for instance, I give you a few examples, there were a lot, but the traffic nowadays, it's much more traffic and more heavy than in the 1960s when it was designed and built. But also the maintenance of this bridge was very bad. So you could see corrosion on the steel parts, you could see cracks in the concrete, if you don't maintain those, this can happen. So all these small factors may be together accumulated in this terrible disaster. This is something that you probably know very nearby at Eindhoven Airport. This parking garage collapsed and uh, it was still the construction phase. It was almost ready and it collapsed. There were some warning signs there were some cracks, people saw it, as we found out later, but nobody was alarmed. The cause of this collapse was, and you probably heard that, the prefab concrete floors. This floor type is used in a lot of buildings in Holland, but for this special design, they were not suited. And that is what we found out after investigation. So a lot of studies were done on this disaster. And even some new rules are now in place for these type of floors. And as a consequence, almost every building which in Holland which contains these floors had to do an investigation. And also Bauku did some of these investigations and I come back to that later. So that is a big consequence of this collapse. Well, this is a project in two, 2015 and in Alten aan de Rijn, they had to change a bridge with a new one. So just the steel deck and you can see it here hanging in the crane on the left with the orange bit. Uh, Bauku was involved in this project and we checked the design of this steel deck. But what happened is that during the lifting operation from the ponton, from the water, things became unstable and it was a big dramatic collapse. Everything collapsed to the right on the houses and on the building area. This was the result, this picture, and you see the nice orange deck, which we checked the design. But the problem was that we did not, we were not asked to check the lifting operation. So this is an example where, okay, there is a quality check, but it is only on one item. 
the North South Line metro in Amsterdam that was once a few years ago it was in the newspapers almost every week because it took a lot of money and the planning uh, it took a lot of time but there was one special damage that also uh, was a lot in the papers and it were here the houses at the Vijzelgracht where they built a station on a few meters from these houses underneath and there they used this uh, deep wand type concrete wall panels and there was during excavation turned out to be a leakage you can see it with the A on the right that leakage transported water of course but also sand and that had a direct and immediate effect on the piles of those houses which started to sink down a little um, people had to be evacuated because this was in the center of Amsterdam there were a lot of people with cameras there was even a television crew so live on television these families had to be evacuated which is also not a good thing for your project on the PR point of view they had to reinforce these houses with the wood panels and after the project was successfully uh, finished uh, they had to rebuild these houses entirely and another one where during construction this soccer stadium in Enschede the roof new roof collapsed so this was construction phase the steel structure itself was stable but the construction phase all the steps that the builders had to take they did not follow the plan so they forgot to install some uh, structural uh, some structures and that's why this collapsed they did not follow the plan the asset stadium which was in use a new stadium and it collapsed is part of the roof luckily the stadium was closed at the time and when they, they found out that the welding the connections in the steel bars the welding especially they were not of a good design and not of a good quality so these are things that happened in 2019 no casualties luckily now this is the most dramatic if you ask me the Grenfell Tower fire disaster in London 2017 70 people died and what happened here is that a few years before this they put on a new facade that's a gevel in Dutch facade and that facade was in itself all right but the connection with the existing structure with the concrete uh, there were some holes so those were connected from bottom to top air holes and that means that you could have a chimney effect and that was exactly what happened so a fire starting low could transport within minutes to the top and also around the building so that is why you need extra precaution on these facades and I will go to the, come to that back later in my presentation so this was the last of this example and what we've seen is uh, also I've told you about the different causes already and there are have been a lot of studies on the origins and the causes of damages research and investigation and these are three examples in Holland on the left there is a Kur report failing constructions where the engineering firms and the Dutch contractors together have made this study about all the causes. Then in the middle you have a report of the Onderzoeksraad for, for Veiligheid and they can decide they're an independent uh, state uh, study group and they can themselves choose to investigate a disaster what they did at uh, the parkeergarage in Eindhoven for instance. And on the right, you have a recommendation about how to handle your structural safety on the right way. So just for some examples of studies that are being investigated. We have seen the damages and most of the things that I've shown you have had an effect on the stability and the structural safety. 
So if you talk about damages, that is what you think about a lot. But you also have, well, fire safety, of course, the Grenfell Tower. But smaller things like water tightness or the air tightness of your building, the installations working properly. Huh? Can you work in the summer or is it too hot? Is your building, in other words, fit for purpose? And if that is not the case, then you also talk about damages. And those are, of course, have a less effect, but still damages, and you have to repair them. And it is calculated that in Europe, the costs of all failures and repairs have an average of 10 to 15% of the total investment in building projects. Well, if you know that the profit margins for a contractor or a designer are very, very small, you can imagine that it is everybody's interested to lower these costs and this percentage. So, there are some known causes of damages. And if you talk to an experienced person in the construction industry, he can tell you things like this. The focus at projects is mostly on the price. You want a low price and you don't look as much at the, at the quality. There's also a growing complexity of structures, high rise buildings, complex bridges and tunnels, and also complexity of the codes. So that is a known cause of damage. You can make an error. Then along the way, when you're making your project, there sometimes are modifications, changes, and you have to adapt. That is a cause of errors. These complexity of the structures also make use of complex computer calculations. Sometimes it's just a black box and you have to be very experienced to know what you put into it and what comes out of it. So sometimes there is a lack of ex expertise. Uh, big projects also are divided into small pieces. So there is a subdivision of the works. And if there is a lack of coordination on top of all those parts or supervision, not enough, then that is a known cause of damage. And with every project, you have a time limit. And if you want to make a design or a construction under time pressure, that's mostly not a good idea. So. Now, let's look at the origin of the damages. And then there are three big pieces. The origin of the damage for 30% is estimated to be in the design. So a design error by a designer. A bit less, but also. 23% has to do with the execution of the work on site. So building on site, and that can be an error. And this is also interesting. 23% has to do with a defective construction material. So there is a fault in the material that you are using. So these three pieces are very interesting if you are looking for quality control. So some other data. There is an investigation or research done by these two people that are here. Uh, it is from a few years. It is an old uh, research um, project for them. And they say, well, we looked at 500 cases of failure and we try to look at the details. And again, they say there is a percentage that happens in the planning and design and in construction. Well, you see here 37, 35. That's about the same as the, the graph I showed you. But if you look at the cost, then it's interesting that the percentage of the cost of damage in the planning and design phase is double of the construction. So if you make an error in the planning and design phase, it's a very expensive error. Construction is half of that. Obviously, and it's a logical thing, if you look at injured persons and even killed, so casualties, you see that during construction, when things go wrong, it uh, you have more injured persons or even kids. So that is some interesting data. And this is the last one I'm going to show you, just the highlighted sections. If you look at the type of errors, then they have found that in the design and in construction, first uh, row is design. You say, well, what is the cause? In a design, it's just the insufficient knowledge of the designer that causes an error and also some lower 13% neglect and error. So that is like you make an error in the design because of insufficient knowledge. 
and on the right for construction errors. You see, it is ignorance, it is thoughtlessness and necklance, negligence, which means well, people are not prepared well for what they for the work they are doing. They don't follow the plan. They improvise maybe, and that is a type of error for the construction phase. Okay, so I told a bit about the onderzoekraad voor veiligheid. They did a report with recommendations, and I well, in general, what they said is you have to have quality control. It is needed for every aspect of safety. So not structural safety is also safety for the people who are working on site. Every aspect of safety, you need quality control. Then they said, well, you have to organize professional criticism. So in Dutch, professionele tegenspraak. Not only people who say yes and agree with you, but also some criticism. And you have to organize it. Then you have to do risk management and not uh, only in the, at the start of a project. You have to do it systematically, every step of the project. You have to learn from mistakes. So in Dutch, from a schuldcultuur naar een leercultuur, don't blame the person who did it wrong. Learn from it. And you have to have more focus on safety in the tender. So when you are buying your project, if you are, uh, if you hire your design team, don't just look at the price, but also look at the quality and safety. That's what they say. Well, when you know that, now we can go to the quality control. Because what they say is nothing new. We have the Eurocode, and in the Eurocode, it has a paragraph about quality control. And I'm going to skip this one. They have some very interesting tables here in Dutch, which says how to do your design checks. And if you have a project with a uh, consequence class one, that is the lower row, right? you just have the simple project, maybe just a home, one simple home. If you want a design check, you can do it yourself. So the designer can check, no problem. But if your project becomes more complex, say an RC2 project, then they say, well, you have to have a quality check of the design by another person. So not the designer himself, but maybe his colleague. And you have to organize it. So you have to do have some quality procedure in your organization. And for the highest row here, so RC3, these are the complex projects like uh, which are used by many people in, uh, every day, tunnels, high-rise buildings. Then you need an extended supervision. You have to have a third party check, an independent third party checker has to check the design. So not someone from your company, not a colleague, someone who had nothing to do with the design and the calculations. Now, this is very interesting. This is what Bauku does. So you have the same table for the inspection levels. So building on site, quality inspections on site. There is also for the highest risk, the RC3 projects, you have to have a quality inspection by a third party checker. It doesn't state how many inspections or on what subjects or what risks, but it is a first step. Uh, Bauku does this third party checks. But remember, I have to tell you that we do not do a 100% control every day. Yeah? So that's not what we do. We do a risk based quality control. Otherwise, it would be too much time and too expensive for our clients. So the clients themselves, they chose to give us an assignment as a risk based quality control checker. And at the start of the project, me and my colleagues, our project team, we look at the first design and we start a risk file, a risk dossier. And in the beginning, we say, well, this can go wrong, that can go wrong. And then we make a kind of a strategy what to check in the next design phase and also at the construction site. And every check that we do, uh, we go back to our risk file and the file to a lower risk, medium risk, green, 
then everything is okay. And at delivery, when the project is finished, we can give you a declaration of compliance. So we say this is a project, this project is all right. So in a nutshell, the, the work that we do. Uh, this is the graph that we've seen before. So where do we focus with our risk-based checks? The design, of course, the blue one. We check for errors in the design. We check for errors on the building side. And also, we check for errors with the materials. And with the examples of projects that I'm going to present later, we're going to focus on the, these three main parts. So, here we go. Some examples, and I have worked here as a project leader for this uh, at this nice hotel. You probably know it. Uh, in Amsterdam, near the, uh, the highway A10, you can see these three triangles. And on the right, you see the a building face halfway. And we did the quality checks for this project. So first of all, like I told you, we start with the design. And these complex projects, they're all designed in a computer model, 3D model. And you can see an example of that model on the left, that is from the design team. Now, how does Bauku check that design? It is in a model, it is not our model, and we do not use it because then there is the risk that we make the same mistakes, or maybe there are mistakes in the model, and that is not how you check. For an independent check, we also make an independent, our own calculations. Well, like I said, we do not do 100% checks, so we cannot make the same design. So what we do, and we try to do it in a simple way, is maybe make a piece. Uh, we take a piece, maybe just the tips of the triangle, and we make a calculation sometimes by hand. And you can see an example on the right the design that a colleague of, of mine had made. And for the concrete core in the middle, which gives the stability, we also had our own 3D computer model. So combined, we did these checks. And then if we are finished, we compare it with the design team. We compare the movements and the forces, and the, so the design. And when it's all right, or maybe there is a small difference of uh, 5%, then we say the design is OK, we agree. And if not, then we are going to ask and say, well, there is a kind of a failure, we think. Well, if you look at the structure, then you see that there is a mix of concrete and steel working together. And that means that you have to have these models in the computer to properly get this, some pictures. Uh, where you can see the different materials. And we are head check this, of course. There is one item that I want to go into detail, and that was the connection of the concrete floors with the concrete stability core. And we saw in the design that they used a kind of a device. You see it on the right, a prefab rebar device. In Dutch, it's called a stekkerbak. And we knew this device, but for smaller projects. And we had the question, is this suited for this, these kind of high forces that you have on these 90 meter high hotel building? You see on the left, the stekkerbakken, they go into a wall, you pull concrete, and after that it is hard, you peel off the small piece of concrete and you bend the uh, rebar horizontal and on the right you see you can connect then the floor to it um, we had a big discussion and then we uh, decided together with the design team that we would ask TNO to give a second opinion TNO and did some research on it and they found out that in uh, in other countries they use this uh, type of uh, rebar and uh, they advised us to do certain type of calculation to prove that this was all right. We did it, and thanks to TNO and the second opinion, we solved this problem. 
So that is a bit of a, a detail for you, an example of how this design check sometimes works when you have a big discussion. Here you see a nice picture of the connection of the floor and the core. This uh, rebar, this stackerbuck, you cannot see it anymore. It is in the in the concrete on the right, in the wall, but is now connected with the rest of the reinforcement of the floor. There is a lot of iron, you can see, very solid structure. Also, uh, we checked the facade because of this hotel. Uh, it has to be very comfortable for the guests and there were strict requirements for the air tightness, also had to do with the sound eh, of the highway and the water tightness, so it has to be waterproof, of course. And then you talk about the material. So we check the production of the facade in the production factory. And here you can see some examples. So we did some inspections in the factory, but then you have maybe have a nice piece of facades, but you have to build it the right way in your hotel. And then you can do another check, and that is what the contractor did. So this is not something that Baku does, but we follow it up. We are present at the test. And what you can see here is that they put a piece of facade under pressure with this air hose, and even with the small tube, they put in some water and they uh, check if the pressure stays on and if the water stays in. So for your information, this is how you test the facade. Another piece of project, another nice piece of project, a 150 meter apartment building in Rotterdam, the Kooltoren. And uh, we do an RC3 check from the Eurocode, as I have presented. And that is a requirement for the Gemeente Rotterdam. So the aannemer, the contractor Ballas Nedam, they asked Bauke to do this RC3 check, independent check in design and structure. And on the right, you see uh, a recent picture. So it's still under construction. They are at uh, level 15, I think. And for your information, in the background, you see an even higher building, and that is the Solemn Toren, which will be 215 meters. But well, Bauku is not working on that project. We are working at the Kool Toren. I want to highlight one thing on this project. If you have a high rise building of 150 meters, then the loads are extremely high. So there is a weight, of course, and that has an effect on the foundation. And uh, due to the geotechnical situation, the ground layers in Rotterdam, you have to have 55 meter long foundation piles, which means that is one third of the height of the building. And uh, in the middle picture, you see some small uh, piles, but they have so that is not the real situation. They are 55 meters long. They are incorporated, of course, in this 3D computer model again. And I just want to give you one detail. There is an effect of settlement. So the piles, the tip of the piles, 55 meters below surface, they, uh, they, uh, there is a settlement due to those piles. And in the middle, of course, there is much more than to the edges. And that effect was a very big uh, focus point of our design check. And we used uh, the Deltares company also for some second opinions on this. Then when it was executed, they had to uh, uh, put in place a 160 steel piles, 55 meters long. Uh, so these steel piles, you have to uh, apply them in two sections because otherwise it's too long to do it in one time. So they have welded a second piece, first piece 25 meters, then a piece of 30 meters, and they drilled it uh, with a kind of a bore machine uh, into the ground. You can see the drawing uh, on the right, so a square form with 160 piles, and you can see an example of the tip of the pile, which is a kind of a drill, and this guy is welding up some extra bits, because sometimes there was some wood in the ground from old foundation piles, and they had to draw, uh, bore through it. But for, what are the checks that you can do? Uh, I did some, some myself. Of course, you have rebar again in these piles, and you can measure the right sizes. Uh, you have the drawing, so you look at the type in the combination with the location. That's what you do. 
you look, of course, at the di diameter of the pile. Is it the right pile? And the diameter of the tube itself, the steel. And on the left, you see a receipt for every pour of concrete. You can check the quality of the concrete, the mix. But as I told you, we were not there every day. And the days that you are not there, also piles are being made. And then you can look at the computer because these modern bore drilling machinery, they have a data computer and you can see, for instance, the depth of the pile and the pressures and uh, some more interesting things. So you have some extra information for the days that you are not on site. And together, that is a check uh, on, the, in the, on the building process that we do. About. Well, Grenfell Tower I presented to you and I told you a bit about the cause there. That's why I want to give you this picture. This is from some uh, factory rock room. And what you see here is a fire barrier or a fire stop, which is a horizontal barrier that you have to have on every floor in the facade and yeah, behind the facade. And this could have stopped the, the, the fast spreading of the fire at Grenfell. This is, this is something that is in the culture and, and in every high rise building in Holland. This is a nice picture of the train station in Assen, which Bauke uh, checked the quality. And you see a very spectacular roof uh, from made from wood. Now let's talk a bit about that. But first, and this had, this had nothing to do, what you cannot see on the picture is underneath there is a concrete cellar for bicycles. And that cellar was finished. The Parkeer, the parking garage in Eindhoven collapsed. And this parking cellar had the same construction with the breedplaat vloer. Not, uh, not with the, the bolle vloer, but the breedplaat vloer and uh, the concrete beams that you can see in the right picture above. That is exactly the same structure as in, uh, in Eindhoven. And uh, well, there was a bit of a shock and we had to investigate uh, the, this, uh, this concept, of course. And we looked at our old pictures and the design, and we quickly found out that the sizes of these plates were much smaller than in Eindhoven. We did some checks and it turned out that there was no risk for this project, luckily. So they could start with the station on top of this deck. And then we had a focus, of course, on this spectacular wooden roof. Uh, on the left, you can see some detailed design, the knots in the roof, which transported a lot of forces. They were from uh, this wood. And you can see wood is layered, so it is a lot of planks glued together. And then you see the, the metal knot with a lot of bolts. So this roof contained thousands and thousands of bolts that had to be uh, put in manually. On the right, for your information, we have the calculations of Bauku, our own independent check. With the 3D model, also the roof, we had to have it in the computer because of all the forces and the wind. So that is. Uh, the material wood, of course, is not something that we see every day. So we went to the production factory in Holland, and you can see some examples of the production. You can see uh, on the left bottom the planks glued together and pressurized. These form one of those big beams. Uh, there were uh, put uh, these metal connection plates were put in place. We looked at that. And if you look at metal and these, then you look, also look at the welding. And this is an example where we measure the diameter of the weld. And, uh, it has to be the right one. That is, a weld is designed. It is put in a, on a drawing and we can check it. It has to be good. OK, so from the production factory to the, the building site in Assen. And I did a lot of these checks. You can see some nice picture of how this is built. And there was one special thing that I want to share with you. If you have these 3D models, they can give you the forces in every place in the model. And it turned out that some knots were very heavily, uh, had very heavily forces and some did not. 
and they decided the design team to give these special heavy uh, connections the uh, special uh, bolts you can see them they are marked red with a good a better quality so you had two kind of quality bolts and that is a reason for errors of course so you had to be very careful to put the right bolt in the right place and a lot of our inspections uh, uh, focused on that point uh, we even found some you know, with a red arrow that were wrong we said well there had to be a red dot it's a very uh, it's it's uh, the, the kind of knot where you need that bolt. Okay. The last example I want to give, and uh, we've talked about a lot of materials. We have steel, we have concrete, we have wood, and you also have soil. And reinforced soil is uh, a nice thing. You can make a good design. You have the software for it. There is not a lot of problem there. Most of the problems occur in the construction phase because you have to have very good production and, and a very good construction process and this picture here on the right that's a nice reinforced soil wall but we also have this example where in Groningen they have a temporary road and they made it not with a slope but a completely horizontal, uh, horizontal uh, vertical I mean uh, piece of uh, reinforced soil uh, they asked us to check it and we well we came we looked at this you have to have a good density of the soil and then you put it in these nets these geotechnical structures um, we had found yeah some some things we said well first of all it's not really vertical it bends over a bit we saw f some some holes in it well soil was flowing out we also saw right on the bottom some holes in the on foundation level. But well, you had to prepare that more better. And this turned out to be a very big discussion and they had to do a lot of work over uh, because of our quality check. And this is the last picture. In the end, this is an air picture of that temporary road. And until now it is uh, very solid and in place and there is no problem with that. So this is the last picture. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I hope you enjoyed this presentation and now I'm available for questions if you have. Uh, yes, I do have a question. Um, there are uh many different expertises in the field of structural design. So I was wondering uh, how much can you do in house and how much do you need to rely on second opinions like you did uh, when you involved TNO in the Rai Hotel? Yeah, so um, most of the things we do ourselves, we have these 25 very experienced engineers. It's just that uh, if you have like for instance, this reinforced soil, that is not something that you see every day. So we cannot build the experience with our projects. We try to and we look uh, together, but we have to ask sometimes an, ex an extra party to check that. But if you talk about normal, the structure and also complex structures like the that high rise building, we do it ourselves. That is not a problem. I hope that answers your question. OK, thank you. How do um, engineers react when you tell them um, their calculations are incorrect or how yeah. is the cooperation with external bureaus? Yeah, that, that is, uh, there's a very different, there's a, a range of, uh, of reactions. And sometimes they just get mad. <laughs> but well, if we make a remark that does not go away, in itself so they have to react to us otherwise we just keep it on red in our risk dossier of course uh, for everything for everyone in the project it is better to have a good understanding and a good relation between the checker and the designer and that's why it's very important that we introduce ourselves as a kind of a project startup 
and we talk about the procedures. We say, well, you design, you give it to us. We have, for instance, 10 days to check, and then we can make these remarks in, in, in a kind of report. And if you are uh, give a good presentation at the start and you tell the experience of Bauku, then they are inclined to accept your comments. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, if there are no more questions, then uh, I would like to thank Benno for giving this very interesting lunch lecture. And um, I would like to thank everyone for attending. And don't forget to check the website and register for all the upcoming events. And I hope to see you all there. And once again, thank you, Benno, for giving the lecture. You're welcome. All right. Good luck, everyone, with the study.